questions about uh, we thought we'd leave like an hour or whatever it is 45 minutes of just anything you want to know about anything the personal path personal things um, something that you have in mind something's unanswered you know whatever it is Okay. So basically, with our everyday life situation, we go home, you know, you deal with every day at work with people, customers, and clients, patients, and then you go home and you want to be able to just leave everything out, and what's, you know, besides meditating, is meditating the only way, or is there some other way that we can kind of just relax and get to the moment right there? Hmm. If you're in a busy house and you're affected by it, it's, it can be troublesome. Yeah. Meditation is ultimately the way to go because it's no thinking. But to get to that stage, it's kind of the beginnings of it. Now, if you come home, how many people live in your house, for example? Yeah. Four. Four? Okay, is it noisy? Yes. Yeah. Okay, does the noise affect you? No. No. Okay, so that's good. If you're not somebody that has to sit down and be quiet, quiet, and noise doesn't affect you that much, then you're okay. You know, in the book I suggest when you come home, the first thing you do is sit down for a moment and be calm. Don't go to food, don't think of things you want to do, don't think about uh, somebody you want to talk to, anything else. Just sit for a moment. Once you sat and you breathe and you know, you know, you've grounded a little bit, then you'll probably know what you should be doing and you'll be a lot more peaceful. It's that agitation of, like we were talking about, you know, somebody was talking before about food and how when they drive home from work, they're thinking about food and then said, well, how do I stop myself from eating? If you're sitting in that car and you're thinking about food, you are driving to food. You know, you're not going to stop. But if you distract yourself with music and you think about other things you want to do, then you're more likely to do something else. But if you're driving and food's on your mind, then you are practicing being with food. And then by the time you get home, there's no sitting quietly. It's making whatever you're eating and then, you know. But you can, you, can, well, you can be mindless while driving, it's dangerous. <laughs> you might miss a few stop signs. So, there is a way of doing it, but it also takes practice. It's not being attached or fixated on things. Because actually when you drive, you shouldn't be fixated on the car in front of you. You should know what's happening everywhere, you know, in the surroundings. So you're very aware of your peripheral and things if somebody comes here. So you, you are in a way seeing the bigger picture rather than you know, what the car in front of you is doing. So it's similar, but it's not exactly that. But when you have kids at home, you need to think what you're going to be making for dinner. So that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the questions are you know, coming from how life is. Now, life doesn't have to be like that. You, you're either of the thinking, well, that's the way it is, and that's the way it is. And then you try to fit in some peaceful things in that. Or you say, well, life is like that, and I'm going to change some of it, and then it's going to become more peaceful. Right? So, I've done it, you know, many people have done it. Yeah, you've got kids, but the kids are, you know, under your rule. And it depends on how you set out the rules for them. For example, in my house, sort of five o'clock, six o'clock, we're done with food and we're done, you know, that kind of thing. So I've set out rules and sort of regulations that have just become a habit for everybody from now. So now by the time somebody's 18, they're kind of, okay, dinner's at five o'clock, six o'clock, you know. But if you, if, you, if you set it out later and later, then of course they'll get used to dinner at eight o'clock and nine o'clock. So it's, it's however you set out the habits, however you decide to set them out. Just know there's a norm in society, but every society, every tradition, every religion has its own norm. It doesn't mean it's correct, it just means that's what people accept it. So years ago people used to say how breakfast was the most important meal of the day. But if we go back 
to when they used to say that. You know, miners used to get up at four o'clock in the morning and they were hungry and they wanted to go to work and then they were down a shaft all day and they were sort of saying how important it was to eat breakfast. But we've kept that tradition of how breakfast is important and people now at eight and nine o'clock in the morning are downing all sorts of stuff for breakfast and they still think it's important. But we're in a whole different era of excess, so it doesn't really count. You know, breakfast isn't the most important. It is the most important if it is to you, but it isn't for me, for example, because I don't eat breakfast. Yeah. So, it, always take yourself as an individual. You know, don't take yourself as a collective. Live as a collective in community and help each other, but take yourself individually as today is different, this moment is different. You know? So now I don't go outside in the fog and put on sunblock and pretend it's sunny. You know, I adjust to the weather. It's damp. I need to put on more clothes, be a bit more cozy. You know? So then I think, oh, the food. Food needs to be a little bit more drying and uh, calming. The weather is windy and you know, the elements are moving too much. So I'm not going to go do things that aggravate more you know, what's going on outside and maybe inside my body. So you are individual, but as a collective we live together and we share. Hmm. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. When you say spiritual, mm -hmm. what do you mean? Spiritual is talking about the spirit. So every living thing, but be it um, a moving thing that's not the trees in a way but the animals and the insects and the human body has what we call a spirit in it that thing that keeps you alive that is referred to as spirit spiritual just means of the spirit so that's why I said yesterday nobody can make you more spiritual you are already of the spirit that thing that keeps you alive we call it God you call it perception you call it the light, whatever you decide to call it. It's that in you and within, the guru within, the title of the book is exactly that, that guide within you uh, that's keeping you and guiding you. So the only separation between us and that spirit is the mind. The mind is in there in the middle making decisions. So in meditation we remove the mind and there you are in the spirit. So it's not religious or traditional or anything like that, it's just that thing that keeps you uh, alive. So can you go conscious living or worry living? Or mm -hmm. These are all yeah. considered like spiritual? Yeah. yeah. That's why I said right at the beginning of yesterday was we are here to become more aware. Nobody can make you more spiritual. But you can become more aware of your spirit and your spirituality mm -hmm. if you practice and remove all the obstacles but nobody can make you more spiritual. You know? That's where we get into sort of reincarnation and from this lifetime to the next lifetime and what we did last time and how we prepare. You know? For somebody like me, the next, whatever I'm doing next is important, so I'm preparing for that. You know? So dying and those kind of things aren't that important. It's like something that's inevitable, it's going to happen, so I better prepare for it. It's not something I'm avoiding. Right, so at that time there will be no fear. It will just be, oh, okay, this is the most natural thing, I'm ready. Yeah, so being of the spirit is knowing that the spirit lives within you, this is just a house and one day it's going to drop and the spirit continues. So there's no fear in that because I'm recognizing and becoming aware of the spirit in you instead of referring to you as that body in your name. That's why material world and the material thing keeps us away from the spirit because it keeps reminding us of things and oh this is here and that's there and I need this and oh I gotta eat and that. so we keep feeding material and that's what I was talking about one of the practices of the book was to give away material and that thing that keeps you attached more and more to, to what's heavy you know, because the spirit wants to do its work here it's here to do spiritual work it's not here to do the kind of life that we've set up.
So thousands of years ago, people lived much more in a spiritual way. They lived off the ground and they knew of the spirit more and they referred to each other as the spirit and they had spiritual names and slowly, slowly, slowly over time we, we, we moved out of that. So this is just getting back to that. Somebody like Gandhi, or who wasn't, let's say, uh, self-realized, even he wasn't self-realized. He didn't consider even the, the thing that he wore every day his. So he owned nothing. You know, and he fasted a lot and he ate small amounts of food even when he did eat. He was very detached from all things. So beyond that, there's even more way to be detached. But uh, it's very difficult to have something pulling you down while you're trying to go up. Well, why would you look at it as the material world pulling you down? Maybe, I mean, that could be just your perspective. Maybe material world is actually could be pulling us up as well. Material in nature is heavy. Right? Food is dense. Material is heavy. Well, if you share material, if you have more material, and you share with others, mm -hmm. you're getting lighter in, you know, in the process as well. I mean, coming from your perspective, I'm just trying to find out, you know, there has to be, you know, because we, we are here. And like yeah. you said, you know, there are certain people that you, you're sitting at your path and there's somebody in the Himalayas, a monk, they're going their path and there's, you know, others here. Um, and so I think this balance it, I mean, maybe is it being ambitious or being idealistic, but it, you have to find it. Because essentially a lot of people, I think, you know, want that balance. It's, it's a tricky thing because we want it all. That's, that comes down to that. Right. You know, if we're trying to live a life, I mean, we, we haven't really created a peaceful place on Earth. We haven't. We've created a lot of chaos and we've pretty much polluted every resource that we have. So our way of living is very destructive. So we've shown ourselves that without living spiritually, we will self-destruct and we will take other people down with us. So we've been going down this path for quite a while. Now material meaning, if you own something and you're attached to it, it will keep you back because you'll, you have to put a certain amount of attention on that thing and keep it. So if you have your car and then you love your car and you want to be with your car kind of thing and you, know, you revere it, well it's going to be a problem because now you've got an attachment to it. Whereas if you just drive your car and it, if it gets damaged or not or whatever and it's fine, then you're not so attached to it. You're using it for what it's made for, for to go from A to B. But if your car has to look a certain way and it has to be nice and it has to have the nice gadgets and all the rest of it, then you're a little bit more attached to it. It's those fine, small, little things that keep attaching us you know, to our routine that keeps us away from being spiritual. So it's not really, you know, the law isn't the material is bad. Nothing is good and bad in that sense. It's just one thing is heavier than another thing. So if you're talking about, say, spreading the money and helping others with that and all the rest of it, you still have to make the money and you still have to manage the money and, you know. That's why a lot of the, the gurus and the, the yogis open institutions and places like that because they are now money free. So whatever even money you pay them to show up and to do retreats or whatever, it goes into an institution and it spreads that. So actually they don't take care of it anymore. Right. So they can eat, but that's pretty much all they do, really. So by nature, material is just heavy. It's just, it's just not easy to get out of it. So maybe you're also speaking about you can make it work here somehow. Well, I'm making it work for me, but even my life is a little bit too extreme for most people. But, you know, because I put value on being peaceful and then I'll remove people out of my life if, if it's not peaceful for me. 
So most people won't you know, want to do that. They find that cold. You know? So I, I focused on you know, keeping the peace and keeping balance and everything. And whatever it takes, I do it. Technology should be used. <clears throat> technology should be used on a basis of needing, needing it instead of wanting it. Problem with technology is something new keeps coming out every six months, and you want to update it. Now, do you really need to update? You know, it's a personal choice. Uh, if you get hooked in and you get addicted to a lot of the gadgets then it's not really out of necessity that you need them. You, you want them. So it's that fine line between what do I need and what do I want. But that actually comes into play with most things. What do I need? Very few things, if I really need it. And what do I want? Well, a lot more than I really need. So you have to find the balance within yourself of, you know, not just make it a monetary thing. If you say, well, I really like that, but I can't afford it, or it's too much money. That's not balance. That means money just got in the way of you buying it. But if you say, well, I can afford that, and I can afford that and that, what do I really need? And you know, put it up to, it's another piece of material that I'm going to have to look after. Do I really need it? What am I going to do with it? You know, does it make any difference in my life? Does it make my life any easier? Does it make my life any happier? No, pretty much nine times out of ten you'll find that, no, no, I don't need it. So I bought an iPad, for example, and for a few months I was trying to buy an iPad and it was sold out. And then finally I got my computer back, so I thought, okay, I don't need the iPad anymore. And then uh, I'm doing this thing next weekend, this big summit, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to get the iPad and I'm going to go there and I'm going to record. And then I found out that the iPad doesn't do what I want, so now I want to give the iPad back. Right? So it's all about need and necessity. It's not, oh, well, this is a cool gadget, let me play around with it. So I've made up my mind in that sense. Because what that does is the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that come out, I don't need to go out and buy them. So it's, it's a personal choice. Everything is a personal choice of how, you, how much you get involved or you don't. And you have to make those choices based on, you know, that's why ha what you eat affects your emotion. Your emotion affects whether you go shopping or you eat a lot again. Everything, uh, one thing will keep affecting another thing. So you've got to watch from the beginning of your day to the end of your day what do you get involved with? What kind of people do you get involved with? What kind of work do you get involved with? You know, technology. Are you craving things? You know? Because unless you keep stopping doing a little bit of everything, and eventually over years you'll learn and you'll teach yourself, well, I didn't really need a lot to live on. You know? I didn't really need a lot of food. I didn't really need a lot of things. Uh, so discipline. This comes down to discipline. It's a challenge too, because we live in the Silicon Valley area, which is the make out of it, which is you're surrounded by all these people. Yeah. You know, whose life is technology and you're inside technology, so to just push everything away, which for some of us is just not possible because that's what we do. So mm. to, it's you know, it's definitely a challenge. Sure, you again you have to decide to what degree do you get involved. I mean it would be, for example, like I don't know, a Haas has a restaurant. To what degree does he's around food all the time? To what degree does he eat? Comes down to that. Does he eat all the time? He said, you know, I did that for a long time and it, you know, I got a heart attack. So 
The thing that you think is so difficult to push away, it's the thing that will eat you up in the, in the end. So there has to be some kind of moderation. So I'm not doing yoga and living this whole world 24 hours a day either. You know? I'm just grounding myself in something and then going out the rest of the day. And then I get on and do other things. But I have a shut-off point. I won't go into something that disturbs my peace. Right? So it's, you have to have your own level of shut-off kind of thing. So you live in Silicon Valley, but you know, there's plenty of other people doing other things. You know? People you know, in chanting some nights, some people are doing spiritual things, some people are doing you know, cooking. I know. There's people, people everywhere doing all sorts of stuff. It's just you won't find them unless you become a little bit like that. Peace? That thing that doesn't disturb the mind will keep you at peace. So that has a level as well. So my level may not be your level. The thing that you bring into your life, into your mind, some event, some person, whatever it is, as soon as it enters the mind, you'll see. For example, you, you want something for a long time and you get it. And you get excited you've just disturbed your peace. <coughs> now, you lose something that you really love and you really cherish, you just disturbed your peace. Right? So it's that up and down movement. Let's say peace is this line. It's that up and down movement of keep going up and down here. This doesn't disturb the peace. This is kind of up and down and you can, de you can deal with it. You know? But it's that, oh my God, kind of feeling keeps disturbing the peace. That's why I say I'm avoiding certain things that I already know will disturb the peace. So I don't go see violent movies and I don't go see you know, things like that. Um, places that are so, so noisy. Um, you know, I edit, edit life a little bit. Yeah. Even if I'm in a movie theater and then I suddenly realize, oh God, there's going to be all this stuff. I just close my eyes and start doing my mantra. <laughs> so, you know, you edit. I, I never say, well, just that's the way it is. There's always a choice of how you approach something. So my approach is, uh, as much as I can, I'm going to not disturb the peace. Why do we need peace? <clears throat> ah, <laughs> why do we need peace? You know, that's a, that's a Dalai Lama question. <laughs> but, let me see, how would, would he answer it? Well, without peace, we have chaos. Right? The opposite of peace is chaos. So that's why we need peace. Because otherwise we will be in ultimate chaos. And the mind thinking too much, the mind wanting things, our desires being too high, our senses going crazy. You know. So, keeping the peace means being at even level. It's, in a way, it's a very boring place for most people to be because it seems like life isn't going anywhere and it's like, you know, one day this guy told me, I was interviewing him for something and he said, uh, oh, I said to him, oh, something about meditation. And he said, oh yeah, I tried to meditate one day. And then I thought, how boring would that be if I was meditating? That's horrible. You know? <laughs> and, and I was thinking, he's never meditated anyway. It'll be like me kind of telling you about some, something I've never done. I've never done it. And then the notion of the fact that you arrive at this place and then you're in an empty room and you're on your own and it's boring. You know, it's not like that. You have to kind of do, do things to know what they're like. So, peace you need just so there's no chaos. But if you remove yourself from people, then you will be peaceful. So why have kids? Why be in relationships? Why does all of those things take away your peace? I have two kids. Yeah. I yeah. take every little bit of peace in my life out. Yeah. Not everybody's supposed to have kids. Not everybody's supposed to be married. Um, we're not supposed to just say, well, that's the way it is. That's our dilemma in our society. Our society has grown out of the fact that everybody went, oh yeah, I'll do that. 
just because it was normal. Normal isn't natural. Natural is natural. It's from the nature. Some people are supposed to be on their own. Some people are supposed to have kids. Some people are supposed to have more kids. Some people less kids. Some people no kids. You know, the ultimate thing in life isn't to have kids. Kids are just another being you bring, which is coming through you. You know, but we see them as joy and happiness and all these kind of things. So now, actually, we put a lot of pressure on kids by not being our joy and happiness <laughs> and taking away our peace. Right? So a lot of the things that we do throughout our life, we don't contemplate and sit and say, should I even be doing this? You know, and I know many people who are unhappy. Um, you know, the divorce rate is already showing people that people are not happy. We're not supposed to be in a relationship all the time. You know, our main relationship is supposed to be with that spirit in us. Right? That's the happiest spiritual relationship we're going to have. And then from there, we're supposed to grow all our other relationships. Because um, I think we have this on the tomorrow, discussing this, the, the, the point of view of relationships. Is that a relationship is something that we're having absolutely with everything. Right? We just think relationships are either really a friendly thing or a romantic thing. Those are the two main ones we identify with. But we are in a relationship with absolutely everything, from food to people to nature to everything. And then we have this notion that if we're with somebody else, we're complete. You know, somebody else completes us. And really, we're talking about that spirit within us, not something outside. Because now the pressure of finding somebody that completes us, we're already complete. That means we're not complete if we're looking outside. You know, this path is about looking inside continuously. It's about you continuously looking for peace and then you can go out and share that peace and that caring with other people. But while you're in your you know, unpeaceful mind, what do you have to share with other people? Some chaos. You know? So we have that. We think other people are you know, responsible for our conflicts and we think other countries are responsible for our demise and you know, we have this notion of if we, you know, I don't know, shoot the guy who did something bad that we're going to get somewhere. And we're not. Because we are responsible continuously for what we do, and other people are responsible for what they do. You know? So, in the yogic tradition, for example, many people come in and they're not married, and they don't have relationships, and they just give up their life, you know, to the spirit. So, but they have been driven in meditation and they've given up part of their life already. Here we think that that's you know, not, not doable. But it's a cultural thing as well. People get into a certain way of life of getting married and going into a job and, you know, like my dad used to say, you've got to be a dentist. They make a lot of money. <laughs> you know? I was like, well, what's that got to do with anything? He's like, don't you want to have a lot of money? Just, you know, be happy? I was like, well, where's the correlation between happy and money? Which part? He's like, well, it's better than being poor. I said, well, I don't know. Where's the medium of poor? You know? So it's a very individual choice you make. And uh, the, tru the truth is, I guess, most people make choices and then they don't like the choices. And then they think about the choices later. Here we're trying to become more aware so from now, when you live, from this time on, you make aware choices. Should I put that into my body? Should I be around this person? Should I, you know, it's not that this person is good or bad, it's just, am I going to be useful to them and they're going to be useful to me? You know? Yeah. What is the ultimate that uh, spirit uh, would like to achieve? Is it peace or is there other things besides peace? The spirit is in peace already. It's the mind that's not in peace. Right? That's why we always try to move the mind out of the way. We were given the mind to have um, choice, in a way. So, but the mind is busy with all sorts of different things and it doesn't focus anymore. So in a way we just move the mind out of the way. That's why we call the ego is sitting in the mind, really. So it's, no, it's not useful anyway. Because it's very self-serving. And we're going through a very heavy time of self-serving. 
So the spirit itself has peace. It's just the mind doesn't have peace. These, a lot of these things that we talk about, I try to not talk about certain things which are conceptual because it's really, it's like reading a book about meditation. It's not possible to write a book on meditation. People who don't meditate write books on meditation because there's no words to write about meditation. Right? So it's like writing a book about love. People who are loveless and don't feel love write books about love. <laughs> well, our society, we have a lot of people who do one thing and who don't do one thing and then write about it to fulfill their own needs in a way. So certain things we cannot write about, they're not possible to be accurate on paper, you know, what the feeling is. So we just leave those kind of things alone. So a lot of these things I talk about, I try to not, I stay away from things that are really things that you come to understanding in meditation and once you're there. Because otherwise it's more concept in your head and it ends up being more talk. How do you set the line um, between not to tight, not to loose, and uh, uh, in the situations that uh, there are um, disturbance of peace of some sort mm -hmm. in a relationship? At work, at home, mm -hmm. in different situations with friends. Um, where do you draw the line? Are, are using that opportunity as a teacher, as, as something that teaches you about yourself and the whole situation? And when is the time for you to leave? It's easy to say, you know, it's mm -hmm. disturbing my peace. So mm -hmm. it's, it's that element of aloofness, that, that ego, mm -hmm. that plays a role. But there are some situations that you stay to train your mind, to tame your mind, and, and Show compassion and mm -hmm. you know, all of those things that make you uh, possibly more peaceful person. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do you, I mean, it's a personal question. When, mm -hmm. when you have uh, encountered with something like that, what, what kind of an approach uh, do you mm -hmm. use in a sort of uh, tough situation? I see, I look at it to see is my place there. I don't look at it as am I in a relationship, do I love this person, all the rest of it. That would be like starting to want to start my new path, but I can't because I make up a whole bunch of excuses why I can't. So if I start the conversation with can't, then I'm already in the negative. I automatically look at it and say, where am I supposed to be? Am I even supposed to be with this person? You know, and look at the bigger picture, not be scared of the bigger picture. We often think, well, you know, we give those marriage vows and we say everything is forever. And absolutely nothing in the universe is forever except the spirit. So we're making sort of false judgment in a way. Uh, that's where misperception comes in. That we tell ourselves that all things are forever. You know, our society doesn't even prepare for death, which is the ultimate one thing way before taxes. You know, some people found a way to get out of it. But just, you know, death is the one thing that you, you're going to get there. So why are we avoiding it? So coming back to your question, the ultimate thing I do is look at the whole big picture, where am I? I always bring it back to me, not the other person. The other person is just showing me a whole bunch of things. But they're not the cause of my happiness, they're not the cause of my uh, sadness, they're not the cause of anything. They're just another person in the vicinity. I am the cause of all of those things. Right? So the first thing I do is look at my usefulness in their life, not their usefulness in my life. So, in removing myself from somebody is partly because I'm not useful to them anymore. If they've got too much of an attachment to me, then I start to move away. Because attachment will bring you down eventually. It means I really need you, instead of, well, I, I want you. Because the want and the need is two different polar pulls. So once I've figured out if I'm even useful in this relationship, whether it be a romantic, friendship, or whatever, and if I even have a place in the other person's life in a useful way, then I make a decision based on that. But ultimately I already know. Because what I do is I put myself in an aware situation of looking and observing and seeing, and before it happens I say, oh, okay, I see. It's kind of like looking over there and seeing that there's a drop coming. You know, or is the road still flat? I can see it. 
you know, I can see it down there. And actually, everybody can see it. We just have this notion of, well, if we just push a little bit, maybe that, <laughs> the road will continue. And we can see it, we can see the drop, but we just don't want to see it. We've decided out of choice that, you know, so people get to that point and then they get super upset. So all I do is just look at it and go, oh, I see. I'm in no denial about where it's going. So then I remove myself. You know? So there's no difference between all of us. We're all exactly the same. I'm just living m with more awareness because I just practice awareness every day. You know? And the one be beyond me practices even more awareness. So I learn from you know, my teacher and how he's detached from things and he teaches me and, you know, and I bring it to you. But it takes effort. You know? And it takes a little bit of detachment from detachment from uh, from things and people, because people are material in a way too. You know? We get emotionally attached. Well, maybe your ideas. Anytime you look at somebody else as any cause of absolutely anything to you, now you've got an attachment. If you don't see the other person in any sense doing anything for you, you're detached. Then you can enjoy each other. You know? This is something I was going to talk about tomorrow. Is that true enjoyment of each other is when I am so rooted in the spirit, and you are, and we can play. But we are coming out of rooting of knowing where we come from, instead of the mind saying, well, I kind of like your hair, and I don't like your dress, and you know, you smell like this, and you don't do that, and hey, what have you done for me? <laughs> That's all mind stuff. You know? So here, the meditation is about removing our senses, removing all that stuff, and then we can just be together, just the way we are. You know? it's, that, it's, it's funny how you meet somebody at the beginning, and you, know, you have kind of that barrier, and that respect, and that thing, and you, know, you dress up in a different way, and you make more effort, and if it's romantic, then you definitely dress up different. And if it's friendship, you try to show your best side. And, and then eventually everybody gets to know each other. And some people are disappointed. They say, oh, I thought they were the other way, but they're actually this way. And all you did was see the person the way you want to see them, not the way they really are. Because what's the difference between all of us here beside the way we dress? Not a lot. And our point of view. <laughs> so and what we practice every day. Yeah. So if we all get up in the morning at home, what we do, how we set out the day, really dictates the rest of the day in a way. And, um, and that becomes us. The foods we put in our body, the talks we have, the conversations on the phone, you know, all of that stuff. So, you know, gossip le leads to more gossip, peaceful talk leads to more peaceful talk. You know, it's all a habit. We're all a, kind of a victim or a, of our own habits. Sure. Uh, I'm seeing um, or noticing just a lot of my friends um, that are, when we talk, we talk about um, physical imbalances, mm -hmm. the body. And specifically, the one that I've noticed, you know, two of my friends like they was, uh, the thyroid. So I'm just curious from the Ayurvedic perspective mm -hmm. of you, I mean, what is the perspective on the thyroid? I mean, obviously it's, it's a very important gland mm -hmm. and, um, it's a, and it seems like, you know, the medical community says, you know, here's your sensoroid, take it for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and you're good. So what is the perspective and have you had any, you know, experience in dealing with somebody uh, who's maybe been diagnosed with mm -hmm. it? Hypo, hyper, etc. So it sits here, so it's in the throat region. Right. This is also what we call a nadi or a chakra, or the energy point, so it's there. So we take that into account. It's to do with vocal, being vocal. And then it's to do with balance as well, because all your endocrine system and those is all about balance. Right? So we take those things into consideration. So you're out of balance somehow. You're not speaking saying something you need to speak. And it's also sitting right there in that nadi, that energy point, that chakra. So, 
I would have to look at you more, speak to you more, or whoever it is, and say, um, are you saying what you need to say? Um, are you depriving this area of something it needs, like either less speech, more speech? Um, and then, what are the imbalances in your body? Why is that particular gland not performing? And then, through yoga postures of like doing the shoulder stand today we did, we're squeezing that gland you know, and then releasing it. When we do the plow and we put the legs behind us, again, we're squeezing that gland. So there's many postures and practices to activate it more. But again, in Ayurveda, we always go to cause, not to the effect. So effect is thyroid gland's got an issue, cause is, well, where does it come from? So, you know, is it something, like I said, I'm not saying, it's I'm thinking, um, I'm holding back something. Because we, we just see disease as a blockage of energy, that's all. So, so some, what would some of the causes be? I mean, what, are, what are some of the causes that you've seen? I've seen people being diagnosed who have like MS or the beginning of MS, nervous disorders, that's been an issue for that. Um, it's a hormone, so it's been deprived of certain types of food or it's too much of different foods. Depends on the person. Are they a bigger person? Are they a smaller person? You know, it's really individual. You know, we, ne we never go to that one thing. That's, that's the difference between modern medicine. It just does give you the pill and says, you know, try this and let's see if it works. We really need to look at everything in this body, you know, and see. Because it's no good giving you something and using you as a guinea pig. It's more like, where, you know, what's your activities during the day? You know, are you inhibiting the body in some way? What is your stress level? You know, do you have a lot of computers around you? It's a lot of that kind of talk. You know? And then we come slowly, 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 slowly to cause and we say, oh, okay, it's going to be probably this. So in the same uh, lady that I treated, you know, the doctor has put her on thyroid medicine, told her she's got the beginning of MS. Um, so when I was talking to her, and I think this story is in the book, was... Um, you know, one thing she said to me was, I don't like myself. You know, so, okay, there we have, we have a cause <laughs> already. Now, why don't you like yourself? Behind that is another, you know. Well, I don't because as a child, this and that, da, da, da. And I say, oh, okay. So you picked up the false notion that you were a kid and these things happened and now you don't like yourself. But those things happened to you as a kid. That was mud on the body. You've washed it. Should have gone by now. It's just, it's like a patch of mud that you refuse to wash away. And you wanted to show everybody, hey, look at the mud. So, it was just that, getting her to wash that piece of mud away of memory and say, oh, actually I'm okay. That happened 15, 20, 30 years ago. Why am I even thinking about it? Then, why don't you like yourself? Well, you held on to that thought and then... So we started to get rid of her nervousness through treatments on the body. Um, I think we did like oil enemas and things like that because the body was quite dry. And then we did yoga postures. And, and, it, and then she went back to the doctor and nothing was wrong with it. So we did, you know, for the thyroid, we just pretty much brought her off that. But if you've been on it for a long time, it will make you tired for a little while. You know, so dosage can come down slowly. Yeah. Are there different types of uh, spirits, just like different bodies and mind? Or is there only one spirit that we share and we, have, we all have the same spirit? Mm. Let's, uh, let's say the mothership is the spirit. Let's call that whatever you want to call it. From there comes spirit, you know, other spirits. It's still of the same, you know, the ultimate universal energy, let's call it. From there, other energies come out. So there are different types, yes. Yeah. Because individually, in each one of us is that spirit. And then depending on how we choose and what we do with this life, you know, the spirit leaves and it comes back. But again, that notion isn't really real until we meditate. That's when we understand spirit. Because otherwise spirit's not understandable. Bikram Yoga. Bikram Yoga. Um, 
<laughs> Bikram yoga is, again, not my opinion, but if I look at what Bikram yoga is, you come into a room, it's heated above, uh, I think, 100. I've taken one class about 10 years ago. And uh, so the notion of coming into a room where it's very heated, the idea is through Bikram yoga that you open the body and you sweat toxins out and your body becomes more flexible quicker. Now there's no shortcuts in life. So if we go by that rule, you can't open your body up so quickly because it stretches the muscle way too quickly. The other thing is being in a room that's heated to 100 and something degrees isn't good, especially for the fiery kind of person or the airy, dry person. It's very bad. Uh, the other thing that happens is the in endocrine glands that sweat and your, and your glands in the body in general are profusely sweating. They are working overtime. On top of that, you're doing yoga posture. So you're doing this. The posture itself is now becoming excessive simply f because you are in a room breathing other people's toxins. So the level of oxygen is very low. So I would say from all that information, you have to make up your own mind if it's for you or not. But it's not somewhere I go because well, I don't go to yoga class in general, but it's not somewhere I would recommend people go. Yeah. And yoga has become, the yoga posture has become so important to people. And it's the, the only physical part of yoga life uh, that's sort of, you know, in TV you always see those demonstrations because you can't really see the other parts of yoga. They're all done internally, the breathing and the, and the concentration and the, you know, the meditation. Everything is internalized. So that one part of yoga that you can see is posture and it's the one thing that absolutely everybody can have a go at doing. So that is what the Western culture took and called yoga. So Bikram yoga and Ashtanga yoga and Ayanga yoga and Vinyasa and you name it, they all came out of the tradition of Hatha. Yeah. So Hatha yoga was what posture was and then people took it and as we became more material and more egotistical, people felt that we have to change the wheel. So the wheel has now become a little bit triangular and all sorts of different shapes in the yoga world. But uh, Hatha is the basis of all yoga. You know, yogis watched animals stretch, they called them by animal names, and you weren't doing this power yoga, and you weren't doing it fast, and you weren't, you know, you were just doing it so you could sit in meditation. So we never gave much importance to actual physical posture. Okay. Why is, I mean, why is there this just, yeah, just so you can sit like this. Well, the spine is up, you're ready. Chest is open, you're ready for life, you're ready for the energy to flow. You know, in other postures, if you're just sitting and you have you know, your legs here and you know, you're sitting like this, and eventually you fall asleep. You know? So, you know, it's a system that you... You know, I, was, I share with people when my teacher teaches me, I don't doubt anything he says in that sense. And these people who brought us these traditions were practiced in the spirit, so they were pure. You know, like I said, they never sold anything, they never asked for anything, they just passed on from guru to teacher, guru to teacher. It, along the way it all became a little bit um, more and more as we got into the material world, it became where people you know, started to sell it and, and make a business out of it and the whole thing. So the, when the learned people have brought something, we just we just do it. But we've, through the system of our own new system, people have decided to change it. Mm. Yeah. Can you uh, talk about some of the seven chakras? Seven chakras. Those are the best known, what we call the nadi points. So in Chinese medicine, in Ayurvedic uh, tradition, we have what's called marma. So marma is energy points around the body, 108 of them. And these energy points are for the inside of the body. Then the ethereal points in the sense that they're not, you know, you can't dig them out. They're just 
in the body itself. And they, for instance, if I press here, somewhere between the top and the middle, right here in the middle, I find the digestion point. So I can feel the digestion move. So if I want to get into the stomach and the digestion, I go through here. And I can go through it on the other arm. I can also go through the back of the leg. So these points are less known. The seven chakras are the ones that are known, um, or let's say the bigger chakras. Uh, from the bottom, Muladhara is the base root. So from here, energy travels upwards to Sahasrara in the top. So when we meditate, we sit up is for the spinal cord to be straight and for the energy to shift through the chakra. Again, the energy point. Because most things in the world are unseen. They're not really seen. So the energy that travels within the body, it's an unseen thing but you will be able to feel it. So energy is called Shakti, and some people have heard of Kundalini. So the Kundalini is described as the serpent that moves through um, the chakras in the middle. And what it does is, it's, it's spoken of as uncoiling. The energy is uncoiling and shifting through all the major chakras, which is Muladhara, coming up to Swadishtan in Manipura, Anahata, you know, Ajna, and, uh, and then you come to Sahasrara. Right? So the energy is just moving, and Vishud. So you're moving through the second, uh, and it's not easy to move this energy up. You know? It usually sits down here. So in the material world, most people are having sex with this energy. They're not using it for much else. So we're eating, we're having sex, and we're sleeping and all that. That's really from this energy down here. To move that up, that's what we do through meditation and some people through Kundalini exercises. They feel that energy move up. Uh, to do that in a voluntary, to be voluntary, it's very difficult. So some people sometimes get that shooting energy going up to the top of the head or they feel something in the chakras, but that's involuntary. That happens to everybody in their lifetime at some point. Or especially here in the third eye, they, you know, it opens up and you see a great light. But again, what we're trying to do is open up the body, sit like this, sit up tall, and then we're going to start feeling the energy move through the chakra until the top. So as you think about the chakra, just think about them as energy points. That's all. From here it goes up. It's universal. Everything moves in a circle. You are, you are already connected to the universe, you're just not aware of it. So again, the beginning is becoming more aware of it. There's nothing actually you need, there's nothing I can give you, um, there's nothing anybody can give you. You came into this world perfectly complete. You just forgot about it. So all you're doing in practices that we're doing and the information we're sharing is, I'm reminding you that, hey, you are complete. You just got distracted along the way. Yeah. So it's, it's all in the practice. Yeah. Yeah. If we came to this world complete, what was the purpose of creation? Staying complete. <laughs> but we forgot. It's kind of like the child that comes into the world. It's fully bended. It can put the, you, know, you can put the child like that and it's a ball. It's flexible, it knows when it should eat, what it shouldn't eat. It's come into the world for a purpose of serving other beings. And we all have, we've just forgotten it. And then as the baby grows and grows, it becomes stiffer and stiffer and it forgets why it's here and we become us. So all we're really doing in this work is going back to the way we should have been and knowing what our purpose is in life. You know, that's what we've forgotten is what is our purpose. So some of you ask me, well, how do I come to my purpose? I have no idea what's going on. I say, well, if you have no idea, then at least start making your purpose about serving other people, serving the planet, um, being more conscious. You know, that will bring you to your purpose. Because once you start thinking that way, you'll start to move all the other things out of the way um, to get to your purpose. It's one of those things, again, you can't write a book about these things and 
you can guide and show somebody the, the road and the path, but it's not something that anybody can walk for somebody else. You know? And I can't say to you, yes, your purpose is this, and this is what you should be doing. Something that you already know, you've just forgotten. Our, our world hasn't been set up for us to, to really be kind and selfless. It's a very selfish world. So, the, these are concepts of, you know, do I go out there and I just help people? I mean, what, what's that about? It's it doesn't quite work like that. It's a process of knowing where your place is in this world. So when I went on my path, now I chose, and I said, whatever I do, I'm not exactly sure. That's when I told the story of how I started to teach yoga and stuff. I was like, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going, but I do know I need to serve other people. I need to be detached from money and possessions and objects. I do need to prepare for my death, and I need to you know, be a little bit detached from everything. So all I did was set an intention of following that, and then I found my path. Right, so I did build a little bit, and then the rest I remembered kind of thing. Oh. This is what I'm here for. Right. But there's a certain amount of work you do. If you really love your life the way it is, you're, you're not likely to do change very much. You know? That's why if you usually see, you know, when I told you I fasted for 28 days and stuff, it's usually when you get into that desperate stage of kind of like, God, just take me. You know? <laughs> Throw me about and do whatever you want with me kind of thing. You know, that's where some people find religion and some people um, find the spirit and other people find other things. So maybe everybody want to close their eyes for a moment and just sit, sit with the information, sit with the thought, and just maybe just sit quietly for a moment and settle down before we eat. Just breathe and focus on your breathing for a moment. See if the body's tired, if, it's, if there's any emotion in the body, if it's happy, it's sad. Just become a little aware of how you feel. <coughs> 